Hello everyone, this is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. So yesterday, as promised, I posted on Patreon, for patrons only, the next installment in the origins of the First World War. And this was part six on Germany. And obviously this is a very important installment in the series, since Germany is the country that is most often pointed to as the culprit for starting this war. And so in this lecture for patrons only, I discuss in great depth the roots and unification of the German state or the German Reich that actually entered into the First World War that was such a divided and conflict-riven state and how that may then have contributed to Germany's entry into a war that originally had nothing to do with them, that was really an Eastern European conflict over control of the Balkans. So I customarily keep patron-only lectures on Patreon exclusively for one year. So this lecture on Germany follows several other patron-only lectures that I've posted over the past year, including the previous Myth of the Month on Culture, and an installment in Doorways in Time on the Great Archaeological Discoveries, and this one was on early audio recordings. And I hope I won't give too much away if I mention that actually some of the same people and figures who come up as so central in this Germany lecture also make a surprise appearance in that lecture on early audio recordings. Also, a few months ago, my post on Bosnia in the origins of the First World War and why and how it is that this war initially broke out over an incident in Bosnia. So if you want to hear any and all of those, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. Sign up at any level. It makes a tremendous difference. It's what's made it possible to keep producing this podcast over the past several years. And really, any contribution, even a dollar, means a tremendous amount. So please follow the link and also tell friends, family, neighbors about the podcast and encourage them to sign up. Now, without further ado, I will give a clip of one randomly chosen selection from this lecture on Germany in the lead up to the First World War. Thank you. of how to go about this, basically between the position of retrenchment and the position of assertion. So on the one hand, Germany could say, we've pulled off this miraculous unification, we've entered the world stage as a new power, we now need to consolidate our gains, foster stability, and enter into a balance of power. On the other hand, one could say that Germany now should capitalize on these gains, maintain the initiative and press forward to drastically reshape Europe with Germany at its center. So Bismarck's approach was the first one, the more cautious approach to consolidate gains, avoid traditional antagonisms, and try to be seen as an impartial, honest broker. In this was the phrase that even Bismarck used, try to be an honest broker dealing with all countries and tamping down tensions and conflicts. And Bismarck's approach was largely predicated on an abiding fear of France. Right? This, is, this is the crucial theme here. For the German ruling elite, it was always about France. Right? France was the big threat, even as relations between Germany and Britain and Germany and Russia went sour. Even still, France was the only country in a geographic and military position to threaten Germany. And Bismarck's diplomacy was aimed at building a broad coalition of allies and friendly powers against France. So the main efforts in the late 1800s after unification were firstly to move towards friendlier relations with Great Britain, and secondly to try to move to make allies in the East in order to stabilize and secure Eastern frontiers so that Germany wouldn't have to worry about that Eastern flank and could focus on protecting itself on the West. In 1873, Bismarck organized the League of Three Emperors, bringing together Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany with the Russian Tsar and the Austrian Emperor. And this league, it lasted for 
a short time. It was tense, difficult to maintain. Maybe this should be obvious because of the Balkans, right? Austria, Hungary, and Russia were increasingly at each other's throats over who would control the strategic points and be the dominant power in the Balkans as the Ottomans withdrew. And so this league fell apart naturally enough in 1878 after the Ottomans gave up their claim of sovereignty over Serbia, Bulgaria, and other places in the Balkans. And finally, the nail in the coffin was the dispute over Bosnia and Austria's move to occupy the province of Bosnia. So as this league fell apart, Germany was forced to take sides. And in 1879, Bismarck's government signed a mutual defense treaty with Austria implicitly against Russia, saying that Germany and Austria would rally to one another's support if either one was attacked by Russia. In 1881, This league was again patched up. Some sort of complicated bargain was worked out to try to bring the League of Three Emperors back together, but it collapsed again in 1885. And after that point, German leaders basically had to accept that they couldn't have it both ways. They had to choose, and they went for Austria for various reasons. The closer geographic proximity, you don't want a hostile enemy right on your border, the shared heritage of the German language, the shared religion. For various reasons, it was strategically smarter for Germany to draw closer to Austria and try to present a firm united front against any possible hostility by Russia. But nonetheless, two years later, Germany did manage to sign a reinsurance treaty with Russia, basically committing both countries to remaining neutral in any sort of conflict, with the exception that Germany would defend Austria if Austria was attacked. So there was still at least some diplomatic effort to suppress tensions, even as Germany now was really more closely tied to Austria. So arguably in these last years, Bismarck was still clinging to the idea of maintaining a sort of balance of power, with Germany as ostensibly a neutral power in the middle of Europe, maintaining peace with its neighbors. But this then fell apart beginning the next year. So in 1888, the Kaiser Wilhelm I died, and the throne passed firstly to his son Friedrich, who then also died after only three months. And so the throne then passed to the first Kaiser's grandson, also named Wilhelm, who came to the throne at age 29 as Wilhelm II. So this was a definite and dramatic generational changeover. Wilhelm's personality was very different from his grandfather's. He was recognizably ambitious, brash, often impetuous, and whereas his grandfather Wilhelm I had been happy to defer to Bismarck on almost all matters, The new Kaiser wanted to be directly involved in policy, and he surrounded himself with his ministers and generals, immersed himself in affairs of state, at least in foreign and military affairs, where again, like Franz Josef in Austria and Tsar Nicholas in Russia, he really was pretty exclusively obsessed with foreign and military matters. Furthermore, Wilhelm saw himself as modern and reformist and willing to break out of old traditional channels. He dissociated himself from the conservative parties and institutions in the German state, which had been the old base of support for the monarchy. So he broke that traditional relationship, and he desired to be seen as nonpartisan and above politics. And he was quoted as saying, quote, I don't recognize parties anymore. I only recognize.